Good morning, world. Maria here, alive and kicking. How's everybody doing out there today? A uh, friend of the show, and I can tell by the post you put all over Facebook about Richard, how much you love him. Richard Grove, and here we are, Tragedy and Hope. If you're not familiar with Richard's work, get over to tragedyandhope.com, peacerevolution.com. Richard's work is indefatigable, and I'm happy to have him back on with me. Good morning, Rich. Good morning, Maria. Indefatigable is a really great word. Yes, it is, because I look at the size of what you're producing, and I know what it takes to do what I'm producing, and I'm like, wow, he's like the Energizer Rabbit. Well, I just try to, like when I'm doing stuff around the house, I like to listen to stuff and do research and learn things and not just be, you know, doing whatever chore I have to do because everyone has chores. So I try to add another level to that uh, in a meaningful and substantial way. And so I end up listening to a ton of things that I find to be interesting. And when I find things that go together, I make these compositions and it, the, it turns out to be the podcast at Peace Revolution. But basically, it, it's things that I've listened to at least once. I found so much value in it that I listened to it once or twice and then I decided to put it in the podcast. And then I got to listen to it a bunch more times to edit it, you know, make sure it sounds all right and to cut out any extraneous, you know, stuff that doesn't translate to a podcast. All right. And I know that a lot of your podcasts are aired on Podomatic, which I used to use and I just ran out of time or forgot about it. And I saw that your show, and I know there's thousands of them there, is rated, you came up number 18 on it. That's superb. Yeah, overall, um, in the, you know, probably the past year, I've moved to be consistently in the top 100. And I think may, they have somewhere between like 70 and 100,000 podcasts on there. So to, to be in the top 100 in the world, that's, that's pretty, that's a, an achievement that's, that's a demonstration of the audience's interest in reality in our history. And they have a section called um, Higher Education, and uh, Peace Revolution has consistently been number one in that for, I think, since it started in 2009. So uh, it consistently amazes me how many people around the world find value in the same things I'm finding value in here in Connecticut because I'm addressing historical topics pertinent to the 20th and 21st century. But in order to understand that, sometimes you have to go back further. And it provides people uh, you know, a keyhole through which you can study reality uh, on a much finer scale than if you just had it all exposed because it's so overwhelming how much we don't know that is applicable to our daily lives. So I try to parse that up into different compositions, and some of them are quite long. Um, but uh, for those who change their habits, I, I get so many emails from people who are just chewing it three hours a day, uh, you know, uh, in their driving time or working time and uh, or more. And that just amazes me because it's like it, uh, it tells me I got to keep producing stuff because these people are going to catch up. I, I've produced a lot of content, but for people that are eating that, you know, consuming that much content a day, uh, and it's not just mine, they, they consume other content, but that's, you know, it's inspiring and it helps me to keep up with it. Absolutely. Well, you know, for 15 years, that's pretty much how I've decided what I want to cover on my show or not. If it interests me, I know it'll interest my listeners. If it doesn't interest me and I'm not interested in it, I don't bother putting it out there. Well, that's a good rule of thumb. And I, I find that, you know, I, there's not too many things that interest me uh, as far as this research that other people aren't interested in, which is great because that's the whole point of everything that we do at Tragedy and Hope and through the podcast at Peace Revolution is there's there's in a there's something going on here in this country and nobody can you know kind of put their finger on it or it's like the elephant in the room we can all describe different parts of it but there is a comprehensive understanding to be had and it takes a lot of time but it's there and it's verifiable and there's a multitude of resources that you can be put in touch with which is why I create media to kind of show people it's like you don't have time for the whole idea right now but let me just show you this one part that's really interesting and then over a series of components or different episodes you can see how all these parts fit together you can see how our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents faced the same kind of opposition and how we can learn our way out of it. Learn your way out of it. I love that. Well, I know you just have uh, your recent episode is uh, number 85, The Future of Freedom and the History of Western Civilization. And I must tell you, it's quite an earful. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, when I put it, it starts out, Richard, it starts out with a quote, and I'm not sure who it was, uh, some man talking about saying that there's nothing wrong with the Dark Age, <laughs> actually promoting going back to the Dark Ages. Who was that? Well, I don't think he was promoting going back to the Dark Ages. What he's saying is there was a lot of discovery during the so-called Dark Ages. 
And so what we look at is the dark ages when there was no learning going on. There was a tremendous amount of learning going on, but it was hidden from us. Uh, the professor that was speaking that, uh, that, that clip uh, is included in, a, in, in the later uh, in the episode. I think he has a four-hour lecture. It's Carol Quigley. He's the same professor who wrote Tragedy and Hope and The Evolution of Civilizations uh, are two of his more interesting books. And what he goes on to explain is that there's a cyclical pattern. There's a repeating pattern through history. And if we can recognize that pattern before it completes its termination of, you know, using America and its resources and moving on to feed on China and, and you know, the Middle East, uh, you know, if, if we don't do that, if we don't recognize the pattern, that's what goes on. They're going to deindustrialize America, that all the jobs will be lost, the economy will be crushed. And after, you know, having seized all our resources, they just move on and feed on a new population. So Quigley's work through and through shows that the evidence is there that people could take an informed angle on these uh, these uh, ongoings in our life, these machinations that are planned uh, to take away our freedom and our sovereignty. And we can do something about it. So the tragedy is it's going on. The hope is by learning about it, by recognizing it, it goes on and being able to communicate cogently and succinctly with other people. We can do something about it and we can preserve freedom and uh, even make it a little bit brighter in this country if all goes well. All right. Well, you know, over the past few days, because I did let people know you were coming on the show on my social media, what's interesting is people are still writing about, <laughs> I know it's hard to believe after all these years, Richard, but one of the comments, and I'm sure it was from one of my listeners, she said, basically, look at Richard Grove and all the work that he's put out there since you were the one that was brave enough to put him on your show with Project Constellation. So people still go back to your work on 9-11. Well, and there's a lot of verifiable aspects of that that are still in play today. Like I said in 2006 within Project Constellation, that NSA and Google and Verizon are all the same company and that they're all spying on us and collecting our private information to feed it through artificial intelligence systems to predict our behavior and to thus control our behavior. Uh, I talked about the corporate aspects of 9-11, which today still people are still discovering and never knew about because it wasn't, you know, put out in a thousand different places. It's out there, but it was all, you know, you projected it into the world. So thank you for listening to the, the original CDs that I sent you. And if you hadn't taken time on a holiday weekend to do that, uh, you know, I might have gone back to corporate world and... <laughs> Not done much more learning. I might have said, oh, OK, but there, you know, you gave me feedback and your listeners, more importantly, gave me feedback that there are people all over the world that are interested in what I had to say that had additional facts that I could learn from and uh, inspire me to keep sharing what I had found to be interesting as far as research goes. Absolutely. It seems like such a long time ago. But, you know, people have to understand when you came out with that, when everybody first started questioning 9-11, uh, to me, we're looking at 9-11 now, you know, 13 years later, and look at what they've managed to achieve in shutting down our freedom, our rights, uh, our right to privacy. You know, we're living in a police state. So 9-11 was really the catalyst for them to just usher in this uh, police state that we live in now. Well, and there's a lot of evidence uh, in the planning of that police state. The post 9-11 world was planned before 9-11 ever happened. And through the post 9-11 world, everything that the terrorists wanted to do as far as destroying the integrity of this country, you know, and everything else that comes along with it, uh, the spying and surveillance and all these other things, that was done to us by our own so-called government. It was done through the NDAA, the Patriot Act, uh, and these other pieces of legislation that conveniently uh, upped the ante and allowed the intelligence community and you know, all the all the various intelligence agencies to focus their their hardware and software not on protecting the country from terrorism, but to spy on Americans. So when you really get down to the political agenda that is underlying and, and existing before 9/11 as far as uh, the will for population control and the use of technology to do that, that's been an ongoing effort with Great Britain since World War II. And there's been a lot of spying by the NSA all, going all the way back into the 60s, the 70s. Uh, so these are not new things. People should not be surprised by them. But I am I, continually surprised that people are so tolerant and that they think they, that they don't need freedom. They don't need privacy to have freedom. They don't need truth to have freedom. 
there's a relationship right. between privacy, truth, and freedom. And, uh, you know, you can study some early American history. Why did we fight the British Empire in the first place? How did we defeat the British Empire? Those are good questions. They're going to lead you to privacy and they're going to lead you to encryption. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I have this conversation with people regularly, you know, and I ask this question. I just say, do you think that Americans today have what it takes to fight a revolution like we did back then? No. Most most people answer no. But we don't need to fight a revolution like we did back then. I mean, the the revolution that needs to be fought today is between your ears, not out on some battlefield with a musket. Uh, Quigley says, um, either in his weapons and technology book or one of his other, or maybe it's in Tragedy and Hope, that during World War II, the government's power to produce and manufacture weapons far outseated, exceeded anything that individuals uh, could build or use. Now, back in the time of the American Revolution, private individuals could arm themselves just as well or better with cannon and muskets than the government can that's coming across the ocean. So that's how we were able to win in part, because we were able to have equal armaments and attain funding for that sort of thing. But during World War II, government technology skyrocketed and national security skyrocketed after World War II. Uh, and this created a great divide between what the average individual, even on the, you know, the best prepper could ever have at their beck and call, uh, as opposed to what your local police department now has, which is war machinery that was paid for, on, you know, for a bogus war in one of two countries overseas that is now brought back home. And the police departments are being mandated to use these things within a certain amount of time. Otherwise, they lose access to these amenities. So the militarization of police was going on before uh, 9-11. Look at the battle of uh, battle for Seattle. The world uh, was a World Trade Conference in right. 1999. Those policemen were not, you know, your donut eating guys in blue shirts and, you know, pants and like, you know, from from the 20th century. They had riot helmets and catcher's gear and shin guards and, you know, all sorts of uh, things that should never be brought onto American soil to be focused on American citizens. Absolutely. Well, you know, here in my little town of 15,000 in the middle of nowhere, Arizona, you know, they had a, a list of all those armaments that our police department got in the local newspaper. The list was a full newspaper size long, including one of those huge uh, military tanks. And a lot of people up here are saying the same thing as they are in the rest of Arizona. Why do you need this? And we don't want this in our town. Well, I, um, when I find interesting articles of this variety, I post them to my Twitter feed. I find that to be, at least for my purposes, a useful trail of breadcrumbs. If I need to go back and find an article, I can just go back to my Twitter feed and I can find it. Uh, about a month ago, I sent out uh, a New York Times piece that uh, provided a map, a clickable map, and you could click your state and see what type of uh, military amenities it has gotten. And after I tweeted it out, uh, someone who subscribed uh, wrote back and, and asked the New York Times, uh, hey, I live in Rhode Island. Why does my state have the most night vision goggles of any other state? And uh, there was no response. But it it gets, you know, lets the New York Times at least know, hey, uh, we think this is a little unusual. And maybe you should, too, if you want people to continue tuning in as a news source. I, I kind of, right. you know, I have to listen to everything and check, you know, whatever's out there uh, because you never know where the right information is coming from. And it also helps you measure the trends. You can see what Fox, Fox or MSNBC is trying to tell you what to do. All right. Well, why don't you give out your Twitter, uh, your Twitter name so everybody listening can go in and, and uh, follow you. At Tragedy and Hope. And it'll come up with, a, I think my picture's on there and uh, talks about my media production. So you'll know that's the right one. But it's at Tragedy and Hope. Okay, so that way people have it. I mean, I know I'm there, but I don't have time usually to go read Twitter. Actually, I, I cheat and what I've got it set up, whatever I post on Facebook, repost on Twitter as well. Yeah, I try not to abuse it. I I post my Twitter feed on, on tragedyhope.com along the side, and I also post it in the community. So I am sharing it in a way such that people don't have to check their Twitter. When they're in the community, they'll see it right there. And um, like I said, I don't use it for really personal things. I just use it for here's a trail of breadcrumbs of interesting articles uh, that I want to keep track of. Right. Now, how do you feel about Ed Snowden? Uh, well, I've never met the gentleman. Uh, I've only viewed what he's done from afar through third parties. So 
I don't think too much about what he said, other than I'm glad that those slides made it out to the American public. And what he says in those slides, again, some of that's reflected in Project Constellation because that was publicly available to at the time back then. So it's not news, but he got everyone to focus on it, and he got a lot of people to change their behavior for better or for worse. I mean, it doesn't help sometimes to know you're being spied on. The, the intelligence community wanted everyone to know that they were being spied on because that's the rule of the panopticon design uh, you know, brought up uh, by Jeremy Bentham. I think that's Peace Revolution 82. Uh, we go into some of that. So there's this, there's an ongoing plan to make people paranoid. There's an ongoing plan to steal your data. So there's like, you could be paranoid, but there's a reality that you should worry about anyway. Don't be paranoid. Just take care of it. Try to nip it, nip some of those loose ends in a bud. Uh, well, you know, we had an ex we had an expression in the '60s: just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not watching you. Well, you could also look at paranoia as a as reality on a finer scale. So it doesn't it's not bad sometimes to get a little bit more detail about what's going on. You just don't have to abuse that all over the place. You know, there are certain things you might want more data on. I watched a TED talk this morning. Uh, I don't watch a lot of TED talks, but I happened to see this title, and it was a hacker explains. Uh, I forget what the it's, oh, it's a hacker explains. Uh, I'll send you a link about that. And basically he shows you like from a hotel room that he can hack into the TV. And from there he can get into all the stuff that you think is secure that you're using the hotel room for. And it's just a, it's a good warning sign it, because everything, including your car is basically a computer these days. And all these things can be hacked and they're not hacking like to hurt you. They're just hacking to steal your data or your credit card number and this sort of stuff. So that can hurt you, but not physically, you know? So, you know, there's just a lot going on out there. And then if people don't stop and look around and pay attention to what's going on, it's going to pass you by. And by the time you catch up to it, there's not going to be a whole lot you can do. You've already given away everything that they need to know to control you effectively uh, through what Aldous Huxley called the ultimate revolution. They're mixing, you know, the, the society is heavily on pharmaceutical drugs these days. And people don't know what's going on and they're trusting people that tell them truth in the form of lies. That's propaganda where they use a lot of truth to still get you to go in the wrong direction. Right. It's very clever, but that's what they that's what they do with those media companies. They've got billions of dollars to play with and make sure that, that all that stuff goes. It's not hard for an individual to start asking questions and throw wrenches and all of that planning. Mm -hmm. You know? What I really found amazing because, you know, we hear these words and for people that aren't really computer savvy, we, they don't mean anything to us. You know, metadata, data, you know, you have Obama saying, we're not listening to every word you're saying on your phone, we're just collecting metadata. But listening to episode 85, that metadata basically tells them every single thing they need to know. And according to the NSA's former director, General Mike Hayden, quote, we use metadata to kill people, end quote, meaning that when they have a drone that they want to assign to a target, that drone's being fed with the metadata to identify the target, and they don't even identify people manually. This is something that we can talk about in a minute because uh, it was included in my interview with Bill Binney that I'm still working on to get out, but he talks about it. He's like, the, you know, the, he could give his cell phone to somebody else and the drone would target them. I'm, and I wanted to interrupt and say, isn't that just like out of a Jason Bourne movie? Because that's, you know, he gives the RFID to the wolf and it blows him up. Anyway, the point is, uh, it's not the smartest people running these things that are being oppressive to us because there's a, there's a lot of Achilles heels, which is good for us. It's good for freedom. It just needs more attention now before they're like, wait a minute, how, you know, they need to triple identify targets. Then it's bad. Then you can't get, you know, the drone comes and you can't fool it. So while right. there's still room in the system right now, there's still play in the system. There's still room to have freedom and to push this system away from America. But as long as everyone's just unwittingly getting the next iPhone upgrade and this and that and not paying it, like, like because we don't have self-consciousness and self-reliance and self-esteem, we are constantly being distracted with the things we don't have. We go earn money. We do that. We let that control our behavior. As long as people are under that mentality, they're going to be totally under control. Their kids are going to be under control. And freedom is going to be extinguished. So it's time that we all just, like, you know, let's uh, back away from that, figure out what are our priorities as individuals, as families, as communities, and start focusing on those things now before they go bye bye. Right. Well, you know, after I listened to uh, the uh, podcast last night, 
where you make it very clear, uh, you, you can't miss it, you make it very clear that through all this metadata, et cetera, they can tell who we call, who we call a lot, who we repeat call, you know, meanwhile, basically being able to identify our every move every day, who our best friends are, who our family are, through the metadata. And it really gave me pause, Richard, because I started thinking about that. And I said, well, what if I actually needed to hide out? They obviously would know the people and places that would, I would be more apt to want to give me cover. And that's a pretty scary thought right out of V for Vendetta. Yeah, but if you didn't know that, you'd go stay with one of those people and you'd get found right away. So knowing that they collect certain pieces of data says, okay, you would have to go spontaneously and meet some people that you've never met before in an area that you've never been before and do all these things. And now that's a lot of different choices for them to you know, kind of sort out instead of just a few. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that's a practical plan or anything like that. I'm just saying knowing how they collect metadata on you as far as the actual data itself versus content like audio and video and all these other things that they collect, you know, and, and, and how ubiquitous are those databases? Because the PRISM program that Snowden informed people about that had been going on, going on for like a decade at least uh, is shared. That's a piece of software that is shared with other corporations and all these other people have access to that database, have access to your data. It's not just people at the NSA. It's not just people like Ed Snowden, you know, who's in Hawaii doing whatever he did. It's a... Uh, it's like it's like people with clearance. It's contractors with clearance. It's potentially 10 million people or more that that's being shared with. And that's the issue. You, you know, it's like you could be like, oh, well, I don't care if they record everything and I don't I'm not doing anything wrong and I don't need privacy. Guess what? Ten years from now, when you want to run for whatever town council or governor or whatever, they're going to be accessing and people have subscriptions to that. They're going to pay. They pay the subscription for a reason. They're going to get dirt on you. They're going to catch you with your, you know, cheating, you know, uh, you know, situation in your marriage. They're going to catch you doing something else. It's like they are collecting the data, not for use today, but to bring the hammer down in the future. And it's the same thing that Solzhenitsyn describes in the Gulag Archipelago which I also did an episode on, maybe it was episode 27 or something like that, where uh, it's, uh, well, there was how freedom becomes free. And then there was the one about loss of freedom. The loss of freedom episode was the, the Gulag Archipelago. So you could actually realize that this has gone on in the past in a very similar way, but they have much more powerful technology today. And there's less ways out because they got Google Earth and satellites and tracking. There's all sorts of stuff that the Russians, right. the Soviets never even dreamed of. Mm -hmm. Well, you know that a lot of this spying, of course, was happening before 9-11. And yet, with all of that, they uh, certainly didn't prevent 9-11. So, you know, you could look at it as a massive failure of their surveillance system. People still question every time there's a terrorist act uh, in the United States, you know, anything from the Boston bombings to Sandy Hook and whatnot. How come if they're collecting all this information? these events are still happening. So do they have too much information? Are they choking on it? I mean, what's the deal? They're, well, they're collecting a lot of information that they struggle to go through in real time, but they're not trying to use it to protect the nation. Even if you go with the official story of 9-11, there, there was hijackers, right, in the official story. And you look at the publicly available information uh, on those hijackers. Now, the study was actually done in 2002 and 2003. They were able to map the hijackers in such a way that it's like there's a whole network in the NSA database that was already recognized. And Bill Binney took this presentation and showed the NSA, you know, here's the guy coming in from Kuala Lumpur. Here's him, you know, doing all these different calls and the information, the public, like when Binney did this at the NSA, uh, his project that he was working on called Thin Thread preserved the privacy of Americans while still focusing the technology on detecting terrorists and preventing Amer uh, American terror attacks and you know things going on in American soil. And that worked until the NSA said, we don't want to do that. It doesn't spend enough money. We want more power. We want to grow our empire. And they went with this other program called Trailblazer. Trailblazer cost immensely more and wasn't being used to preserve uh, in, in the privacy of Americans. It wasn't being used to prevent these terrorists from coming in the country and conducting attacks on 9-11.
Now, you can go all the way up and see that the funding for even the official story terrorists came from the British and American governments. So there's multiple layers that you can learn about 9-11 in which, you know, most people see the ground level, what they're told on TV. And then you can continue to just analyze the heck out of that, that official story. And you'll learn a lot about American history and uh, the special relationship between Britain and America. But the point is, when privacy was being protected, uh, you could still identify that this group was doing some sort of terroristic activity. And he presented this information uh, in 2002 uh, to the CIA and said, basically, look, all this information was available. Someone should have protected this country. And why wasn't it protected? Now, he doesn't get any real answers from that. Because you have to study a lot of history to actually understand the answers. Uh, even if someone told you, you probably wouldn't believe it. So you, you need to take a, a bigger picture of what's going on in the 20th and 21st century. And you need to look at the small microcosm that is 9-11. And you can make the connections between those two patterns. Uh, the agenda ongoing in the specific instance that was conducted that day. So the bottom line is, even with public information, you could have detected those terrorists were going to do those events. The, the date of the attack was specified in email. The uh, uh, identification of the targets was also in email. These are all things that the NSA had internally at the time, but weren't focused on preventing. Of course. It just looks like they were more focused on spying on, you know, the average Joe Blow in the street than, you know, paying attention to what was happening. Well, they started taking they started taking the phone records through Verizon and all these other companies in February of 2001. So, what, eight months, seven months prior to 9-11, the NSA right. had already decided to conduct mass surveillance on all Americans collecting all Google searches or whatever else was going on back then. Mm -hmm. Right. And I remember, you know, under Bush, uh, you know, even the post office, I mean, the post office, I believe, last year got 50,000 requests to go through other people's mail. So nothing even tangible in your hand paper is also being surveilled. I always get a kick out of people that say, well, I don't want to do that online, you know, but they don't get that the spying isn't just online. Yeah, and I'm not saying, like, change your actions out of fear. I'm saying continue doing what you do. Just educate yourself about what you're doing and then make informed decisions. You know, there are certain things you might not want to be online available to everyone forever. So don't put it on your Twitter feed because it goes to the Library of Congress. It's all about right. appropriate engagement with these inputs. And there's almost no appropriate engagement on Facebook with Facebook. But you can use it for strategic purposes. And at the end of the day, even if you don't, you don't use Facebook, the government has plenty of other ways to connect you to your friends. So it's not like that's the big deal. You know, that might be a big deal for burglaries and predators and things like that. But as far as the government goes, they have such a comprehensive record on everyone already. You know, right. you would think that's the question a lot of people ask with all of that. How is it that they don't catch these rapists before they act? You know, it's not uh, in their interest because, uh, you know, crime allows the police to get more power. Mm, absolutely. Now, let's talk a little bit about IP addresses. Because in uh, episode 85, you talk about uh, IP numbers being recorded and users being called targets, not users. Well, I mean, <laughs> they are targets according to those companies. And those companies do work with intelligence, you know, communities like, you know, the uh, one of the quotes is that the uh, one of the greatest things about Facebook is that the FBI doesn't have to do a whole lot of investigation because they just go to Facebook now and they can, you know, analyze and draw a lot of different data. But, you know, without having to go out and do in-person interviews all over your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, right. You know, some police departments, uh, if you want to get a a license for a gun, uh, a lot of places across America, if you want to go for a job, even though it's illegal, will ask you for your Facebook name and password. Yeah. Yeah. And I, cause I say I don't have one. That's what I would say there. I don't have right. one. I'm, I'm one of those people. <laughs> On a good news for you, Richard, <laughs> not having a Facebook page actually adds to your mach machismo. I was getting my hair done yesterday reading GQ magazine, and they had an article about if you want to track women, what works and what doesn't. And they said as soon as they know you have a Facebook page, they already prejudge you without even looking at it. 
and that I guess it adds to your your machismo and your sexual attraction. It's the opposite sex, not to have a Facebook page. So I know you're engaged, but I just thought I'd throw that out there for everybody else listening. <laughs> yeah, for everyone else listening, it, it, it behooves you. I mean, one of the things that uh, I caught in the past couple of weeks was that the remake of The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Uh-huh. And, it, and in there, one of the product placement things, because I watch a movie for a variety of reasons, not just enjoyment. I watch the color correction. I watch, you know, all, all these different layers. So the product placement layers, and there's a couple of those, uh, has to deal with Match.com. And basically, you know, he's a boring guy and he doesn't have anything to put on his profile. And he's talking to this guy at customer service at Match. And, you know, they're trying to pull it together. Well, he actually goes out and does real adventures instead of just trying to, like, make stuff up like everyone else. And then by, right. a, you know, resolve, now he's got self-reliance, self-esteem, self-confidence because he's actually done things, gotten outside his own boundaries, doesn't right. need a Match.com page now, becomes obsolete. Yeah, I thought that was pretty hilarious. I think he was talking to somebody. Was it at Match.com through the movie where he's trying to complete his profile? Yeah, and then they they, they got the uh, I forget what the comic's name, but at the end you get to see who's at who's actually talking to. And I oh, didn't want to see the Stiller. movie. Yeah, I mean, I know well, it was Ben. It was someone other than Ben Stiller that he was talking to. It's another comedian, uh, 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 Patton Oswalt is uh, the name of the other. Oh, comedian. right, right. And uh, I didn't want to watch the movie. I didn't really like the first movie. I had to read the book in school. I w- so, but I, you know, caught myself in a situation where there was nothing else, and it was free. So I was like, I'll check that out. Probably has good coloring. Could help on the Binny project. But I did enjoy it, and I found it. I was like, that was not a waste of time for a variety of reasons. It's a we- very well composed movie, and I think uh, Ben Stiller directed it. So good, good job, Ben. Right, right. I watched it, and I thought it was pretty good too. Rich, we're going to go to a short break, but you've been mentioning him a few times in the first part of the show, Bill Binney, and I want to talk about who he is, what he's put out there. So stay with us, Rich, and I will be right back. Okay, welcome back to Tragedy and Hope with my excellent co-host and friend, Richard Grove. Rich, before the break, we were talking, you've been talking a lot about Bill Binney, and I'd like to have more explanation. Who is he? Uh, what has he done? What's his work out there for, and how demonized is he getting for it? Uh, Bill Binney is a 32-year veteran of the National Security Agency. Uh, he worked there until he blew the whistle in October of 2001. So after the mass spying uh, was upped after 9-11 and privacy was lost, he blew the whistle. So he was their top cryptographer. He was in charge of over 6,000 uh, analysts all over the world. Uh, so he was he's like the top level whistleblower since 9-11, uh, who has come out and explained in great detail uh, how the tax dollars are being misused, not for the NSA to actually practically solve problems, but so that they can grow an empire of ever increasing population control. Population control used differently than reducing how many people are on the planet. Exactly. It has to do with control of individuals through the use of information. And um, uh, what I've been working on for about the past month since we did production is the post-production. It should be about a three-hour interview, uh, filmed interview with Bill Binney. Uh, it's similar to what I did with John Taylor Gatto a couple years ago. And it's it started out with a concept. Well, the concept's easy. We're all losing our freedom and surveillance and the surveillance state is a big part of that. Um, over the years, I've uh, taken the donations that we've received and invested in film equipment and grown my abilities and talent and experiences uh, to the point where I was like, well, it'd be really great at some point to have the opportunity to film, do a film, like a really professional filmed interview with Bill Binney. And at the time, I had no contact with him and I didn't have a crew, but I did have the equipment and I did have the desire uh, to go into that unknown and try to get that done. So after I continued with the idea, I did some research, and that's where I came across some of the clips of Bill that I used in episode 85. He might also be in one of the earlier episodes as well where I talked about the whistleblowers. And uh, the opportunity arose, I think, in August. I was doing a show with Ernie Hancock, who's also there in Phoenix, and it was during during a break. I had mentioned uh, there was a, a London Garden article in August, I think it was, 2014, and the, the population control and totalitarian government quote was something Binney said that they made the title of the article. 
And uh, Ernie's like, well, when I interviewed Bill Benny, this and that, and I said, oh, you know, Bill, I would really like to interview him at some point. And he, uh, he and Donna hooked me up with Bill and sent a couple emails back and forth, make sure it was all right to share information or whatever. Uh, is it all right that they pass his information to me type thing? And uh, I asked him to do an interview and he said, yes. In fact, he would come here to Connecticut. And that was like, that was great because it's going to save a lot of expenses of having to go down to Maryland. And right. um, the major challenge that I didn't foresee. So, you know, there, I had a couple of weeks to plan it out and make sure I had the equipment and the batteries charged. And, you know, I had to train a crew uh, that would do sound and cameras because I can't run everything myself when I'm doing the interview. Uh, I worked two cameras and I worked my own audio, but there's just too much to leave the chance not to have a couple other people on, on location. And uh, the challenge was I thought I was going to interview him here in the house where I interviewed Gatto in the living room here. And uh, Bill's a double amputee, amputee, which I didn't know about. Uh, so we had to find a handicap access location where we could film. And so we, you know, kind of got this all done in short notice and, and made sure he had the proper hotel room and things like this. There's a lot to do when you invite someone as a guest for a filmed interview. I mean, right. I, I remember doing some of it for Gatto, but it had been a while. And so all of a sudden, oh, we've got lots to do. We've got too much to do. Will we get this done in time? And we did get done just in the nick of time to have everything organized on that Saturday. And we filmed for probably about six hours. Uh, there was a lunch break. There were some other scheduled breaks. There were some unscheduled breaks. And out of that, I got uh, maybe four hours of footage. Three hours is actual usable, you know, from the crack, crack of the slate uh, right. type thing where he's answering the questions. And then I had some technical issues I had to deal with after that. So it's, it's taken a lot of time. And I'm only willing to donate so much time to a project when I know the end result is going to be so meaningful and so substantial and so, you know, pleasing to the ear and to the eye that people can sit with their families and friends and actually listen to what he has to say. Because uh, one of the cameras, he's speaking directly to you for, for one, of, one of the camera angles, at least. And he's delivering a message that you could see a very similar type of message going out during, um, you know, the days of the American Revolution. Where it's like, hey, the British are here and they're doing these things and we can't, you know. This is this right. is the anti what's going on. It's antithetical uh, to the founding of this country, and it is identical to the reasoning why we split from Britain in the first place. Hmm. And didn't he also say that the NSA has basically gone rogue? Well, he says <laughs> he says a lot more than that. But yeah, they they have gone rogue. That they are totally not trying to solve the problems. That they're abusing every tax dollar that goes in there. That they are breeding. They have a systematic Borg type of hive mind going on that only breeds yes men that dissenting ideas or what there's nothing you know once the corporation in fact he says at one point that general mike hayden had this quote about once the corporation makes a decision you can't question it and uh so he so he sent this quote to me and then he that someone had sent him a, a quote by us uh, from uh, lenin that basically says the same thing so here's this, you know, Soviet Union quote, and here's this recent quote from the NSA. Oh, look, they've uh, they got the same policies. Nothing to worry about here. Hmm. Well, you know, it's deep. I mean, you know, when you try to tell this to the average American, they just don't get it. You know, they're all just happy with their gadgets, you know, putting their fingerprints down as, you know, ID to open up this gadget or sign into their gym, and they don't even think twice about it. Well, and that's that's the the bigger theme. So the reason I interviewed Bill in a filmed way so I can use it in a documentary film after I interview several other people is to show people, look, this is what they're doing. And you might not care right now that they're doing this to you. But the reason they're doing it is because you will care later. Guaranteed. That's why they're building the Utah Data Center and they're building all these other places to keep your data because they're going to blackmail people in the future. Let's just get right. down to what it is. It's government by coercion, by the use of force and violence against us who, who wouldn't agree, right? I mean, they have a monopoly on force. Who are these people that we trust with all this money? Well, I'll work a third of the year and let me just send them, send them this money. Isn't that, right. what we all do? Isn't that what we all do by paying taxes? You Absolutely. work the first couple months so that they can arm up against us? I know. We're paying for our own slavery and our own subjection. And that's pretty smart from a government perspective to get us to pay for it, to get us to sub it out. They don't have to spy on us. We are providing more data than they could ever get from spying. 
I know. Look at everybody sending in these selfies back and forth to each other. You know, whether they're nudes or not is irrelevant. I mean, we're just handing the information over freely. Yeah, my goal in life is to never take a selfie. I'm good. Good. I try not to do. <laughs> it's just one of my goals. It's one. It's one of my goals, but it's one I'm holding very highly in esteem right now. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. All right. So, how do we skip around it? Is there any way to protect ourselves from the NSA or all the spying? Well, the primary way is to know about it, to be educated about it, to avoid it where you need to. Like, if you're going to be on the internet and you've got some health condition, don't use Google. Use Start Page. Start Page allegedly, and you can test it by trying to go back. It won't feed you what you just searched for. It'll say document not found. So, you know, there's a way to limit your exposure. Like, you know, there's some things there's, I just, you know, I, I don't have any like urge to be more private and, you know, like when I dial a telephone, I know that I'm giving them the telephone number I'm dialing. So I'm okay right. with that. I'm okay with that. Okay. It's what they do with that information that I'm not okay with. Like I don't have unrealistic expectations. If I dial a phone, I know I just said, here's my machine operating code. That's a Mac address before computers, telephones had them. They still do probably some way, shape or form, probably your router. But it identifies it is me. Comes, you know, the phone bill comes to me. That's my phone. I called this other number. Those are connections. Like there's nothing I can do about that. That's the nature of that. And if I want to talk to somebody through a wire, I'm willing to accept that risk. Now, all these other things that go on in the name of preventing terrorism that are bullshit, I don't approve of those things. And I don't see why anyone else should approve of them or would approve of them unless they weren't actually thinking about the consequences. Well, and I mean, truthfully, they had them caught one terrorist with all this spying and everything. Where's the, uh, where's the results? Do you know what I'm saying? If they're using it as an excuse uh, to catch terrorists, well, where are they? You know, that's what everybody wants to know. You know, Jim Fetzer comes on the show. He's got all these facts and figures of how crime is down throughout the country. Uh, they don't even understand why the past 10, 11 years, there were major crime dropping throughout the country. And it's like, well, how are they justifying the surveillance state and the police state? That The answer to that is the role of propaganda. See, propaganda depends on people believing in the official story of 9-11 and under that official story, all these other things then become true, that it's okay for them to extort more money from you for various reasons and give you hassles at the TSA and take away your rights and surveil you because of the aforementioned illusion that no one questions and thereby becomes part of popular culture and thereby becomes a systematic form of deception for everybody who doesn't question. But it comes back to... You got endless supply of question marks. I'd start using them now. That's what I did. All right. Well, you want to talk about propaganda, paranoia, and fear rolled into one bubble. Let's take a look at what's going on with this Ebola crap 24-7. Okay. I mean, the CDC changing its story every day. People paranoid, you know, little black kids in, you know, I forget which state they were in, maybe Georgia. Uh, kids in their class accusing them and calling them names, calling them Ebola. Uh, it's saying they're giving them a bowler. There was an African restaurant that had a chain. Take the word African out of its name of its restaurant because people were afraid if they ate there, they were going to get Ebola. I mean, if you really look at how crazy that's going, it really, it seems to me like they just test the public to see how quickly they can get the fear and paranoia going. Well, isn't that, I mean, that's what's going on. Fear makes us ignorant. Fear shuts off. The neocortex of the mind. It goes back to your reptile, reptilian part of your brain, the fight or flight part of your brain. It's not the part that does learning. Guess what? Nobody that's listening to this is likely to get Ebola. I'll say it again. No one who's listening to this is likely to get Ebola. But we are all susceptible to the anxiety, fear, and pressure that that might bring to our minds if we don't know how to uh, dismiss things that are arbitrary. Now, is there something practical that you can do? Yeah, you can have some extra food on hand. You could be prepared to quarantine yourself if you needed to. All these things, uh, you know, you do during life just in case the electricity goes out or the water main breaks or the snowstorm, whatever. These are practical human preparation things. Beyond that, there's not a whole lot you can do. And you have to learn to stop worrying about the things you can't control and to apply yourself in a learned way toward the things you can influence and control. 
And by doing that, I would, I, I haven't watched any of the Ebola coverage on TV because I'm not scared of getting it. Yes, I know that I go all over the place and how easy germs spread and how long they might stay alive on surfaces. And I read The Hot Zone by Richard Preston back in 95 when it came out. I was in college. It's one of the scariest books I've ever read. I don't recommend reading it unless you want to have a couple sleepless nights, especially since that's, you know, going on on TV all the time. It would not be good for you. But what is good for you is to know that the good Dr. Rick, Richard Preston is uh, an affiliate of the Central Intelligence Agency, and then that book is written as psychological warfare. Okay? Ebola was developed by the, uh, you know, the National Security Establishment, the British, in Ang the Anglo-American Alliance, if you will, as a Cold War weapon to use on the Soviet Union. Soviet Union's not there to be scared of it anymore, but they're like, hey, you know who is scared? The people they want to control in America. So what do they got to do to scare you? Well, they got to show you pictures of these really dangerous disease and it being improperly handled consistently. Nobody knows what the protocols are. Oh, we'll just pressure wash it over, all over the street. No big deal here. And then they tell you, oh, this person got it. This person who was exposed got it. And they're, you know, so it, unless you're looking at it as a game, don't play that game. The game is avoid the fear, continue doing what you need to do. Don't get misdirected or distracted by all these other things they try to show you and focus on the things that are going to lead to substantial satisfaction and survival and thriving in this world and try not to, you know, don't believe the hype. All right. Now, it's a dangerous disease. I would never want to have it. I all understand right. that if you have it, it's not a good, it's not good. It's read the, you know, if you need the description, that book has a very vivid description of it. But I also know that by protocol, in the past, in the 1918 flu pandemic, there's a, there's a book called The Great Influenza. This was the most deadly plague in, on the planet in recent history, 1918. And it was spread out of a military base in America, and it was exacerbated by local business and, and government authorities that were purposely telling people to do the wrong things so that they could study how it flows through the, the culture of society and how it transmits itself. So there were people back then conducting experiments on us to see what goes on. So that's just part of American history. So again, it's not, it's not to panic people, but it is to say giving our tax dollars to a government that does these things to us is not a good policy to have because it has blowback. Blowback could be Ebola. I don't know, but there's not a whole lot I can do about it. So I focus on doing the things I have to do every day uh, that lead to progress. That's how, I, that's how I manage that. Well, you know, I, I think I got it. I'm, I know I got it out of your podcast. I just don't remember at what point. But I said, wow, that's such a good sentence. I want to mention it. And it was learn to outgrow the status quo. I don't know if you made that one up yourself or not, Richard, but it's a damn good sentence. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure I came up with, with that myself. Uh, it's something I've said over and over throughout the podcast. Also, grow in the light direction. I just look at the plants. They grow toward the light, right? That's what we need to do. We should learn toward the solutions and not learn toward, hey, this baseball player had this type of batting average last year. Like, that will be growing in the dark direction. That's not helpful to your survival unless you're going to make a living from that and support your family, protect them from the, the illusions of this world with that knowledge, right? Right. So I just try right. to grow, grow in the light direction, and if I can outgrow the status quo, then you stay ahead of the curve. Absolutely. And I walked into one of my friend's house over the weekend. He's watching some football game. And I could see towards the last, he says, there's only two minutes left. And I said, oh, God, it's football. Two minutes could take a half hour. And <laughs> he was getting all riled up and crazy. And I just looked at him when it was over, you know, and I could see all that uh, energy moving through him. You know, he was happy. I guess his team won, whatever. And I looked at him and I said, did you have money on the game? And he says, no, of course not. I said, then what do you care? I said, I could understand if you had money on the game getting all excited. But how did that change your life to watch these overpaid, you know, domestic abusers, you know, play football for, you know, waste your whole afternoon? Uh, <laughs> you know, again, you know, if you have money on the game, I could get it. But otherwise, I was like, okay, I still don't get it. Well, and it's like uh, I watched sports maybe till I was 30 because by the time I was 30, I was done. I just, you know, that was last year I played hockey. Uh, before that, I played baseball and football, and I would watch these sports to learn how to play those sports better. Once I stopped playing the sports, I stopped watching the sports. And what's more is that there was so much of that time that I spent 
practicing a curve ball or a fork ball or how to, you know, lift the puck into the top of the net or any of these different things that I spent hours and hours and hours on, I wouldn't have done that had I known that there was this relevant, substantial information that I would need to survive that they weren't going to give to me. I would have chosen to spend my time differently. But I was, you know, so we're all denied that that knowledge until we get out there and actually look for it ourselves. And that's why I try to put these milestones and these, you know, just landmarks out there to say, hey, look, this exists. You might want to know about it. I found it really interesting. And, uh, you know, it raises my self-confidence to have a higher knowledge of my surroundings as well as myself. These are the things, you know, so if you want to work on your uh, self-confidence, you don't need to go to the Ferrari store. You need to go to your mind and start understanding yourself, understanding your environment. And those are the two aspects of life that they can they they take away from us, that they hide from us to control us. So that's why everything I do is focused on either knowing yourself better or learning about your environment, the relevant environment and its history, how it's going on right now is a function of its history. So you can understand and avoid the pitfalls in life because I wish somebody would have produced it and I wish I would have listened to it so I didn't have to lose my career in in the corporate world. I could have been a a great donor to several projects, but, you know, my naivete pays off in everyone else's intellect now. Absolutely. Well, you know, one of my favorite expressions is to be a doer and not a viewer. (laughs) <laughs> and I think people are just viewers in their lives. You know, they're viewing TV or football instead of playing it. Uh, you know, same thing with pornography. You know, wouldn't you rather be a doer than a viewer? Uh, but it's a, it's a concept that takes a while for people to get. Instead of sitting back watching life, life happen, you need to get out and make it happen. Well, you don't have to just learn about history. You can be a part of history. It's like there's an ongoing script out there that's, that's, that everyone's acting through. But we're not all writing our own parts in this script. And until you start thinking for yourself, you're not going to be able to say, hey, wait a minute. What would I do differently than the part that's being written for me to get up every day and go work for a corporation? Right. You know, it, would, it would have been great to have a choice like that. I might have chosen this path, but I, cho- I just chose the naive. I'm going to be honest. And I think that there's, you know, protections uh, uh, and, and balances out there. <laughs> but remember this. Your path chose you, Richard. And that's the way it goes. All, all you ever have to do is show up and be fully present, and God knows you are. Rich, thanks so much for joining me today. I look forward to our next chit-chat. Maria, thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you to everyone listening. Have a great day.